Hey guys, and welcome to our, I don't know, a beginner's guide to dystopian so. wars. Yes, yeah. Uh, of course, you're joined by Beast of War Warren and our buddy Beast of War Ben. So we're going to take you through what is basically just a, a kind of a quick getting started yeah. guide yeah. to uh, dystopian wars. This is not a replacement for your rule book, okay? And you know, we may get things wrong or we may do something that you just don't agree with. <laughs> but the, the idea is that you could go out, you and a mate, buy yourself a couple of starter sets in a rule book, yep. watch this video, and within about 30 minutes or so, you could actually be playing a very simple game. Exactly. Yeah. So... You have to excuse the fact that I do sound extra sexy and sultry today. <laughs> I'm still recovering from a from a cold, a man flu. Anyway, Ben, right. what do you need to play? First thing you're going to need is a rule book. Yep. So here That's we have the Dystopian Wars rule book, which is uh, gorgeous. Dystopian Wars is basically it's kind of like a steampunk game. It's set in the yep. the the kind of the 19th century. Yes. Okay. Tail so end of the, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the late 1800s to uh -huh. the early 1900s. Time of Queen Victoria, basically. So, like that, so. in a nutshell, I'm not going to go too heavily into the fluff in this, but in a nutshell, uh, they've discovered this big cavern in Antarctica. Yep. Uh, inside that cavern in Antarctica is all sorts of wondrous technologies. Okay. Um, I don't know who put them there. I'm not sure anybody knows. I don't who think anybody does. I don't, I don't think Spartan Games there. do either. <laughs> <laughs> um, they've, they've found wondrous materials and wondrous technologies that allows them to create steel that's as strong, stronger than it ever was, but is as light as a feather. So you get enormous, enormous battleships, enormous flight of floating aircraft carriers, yep. all kinds of things. It's very steampunky. Um, it, it, the background story has lots of cool things in it, like Tesla coils and things like that. So the book itself is actually quite gorgeous. Um, now, it's a first edition of the book, so you know I'm sure there'll be more and more imagery and stuff come into the book uh, as it goes later on. But the, the book breaks down into a kind of an intro from this fella here, who's the, the head of the Covenant of Antarctica. Yep. He's like, he's like the uber scientist. This guy basically believes that since discovering the technology, which he basically discovered and controlled, that all the nations are getting too patriotic and they're more interested in their own personal gain than the global yep. utopia that he was hoping would be created. So we don't have a utopia, we have a dystopia. Ah. You see? <laughs> you see? I knew I'd get that in there somewhere. So anyway, so in the, the book, it has basically an idea of you know, what's been happening and the locations will be quite similar to you, other than the fact that they're just uber cool now. So you'll be, yeah. you have London, Singapore, places like that. It then covers the, each of the main kind of factions. And currently you have Antarctica, the Covenant of Antarctica, the Kingdom of Britannia, the Prussian Empire, the Empire of the Blazing Sun, and the Federated States of America. And then you've got this nice big global map. Yeah. So... Other than that, you then have the rules, which we're going to condense down the most important ones in this little video. So, there's your rule book. The other thing you yep. get in your rule book is your fast play, okay? Which is um, not much use on its own until you've actually read the rules. Yeah. So, <laughs> you'll want to read the rules, but then you'll want to keep this beside you because it does make it a wee bit easier to reference some of the charts, like what happens when you yep. blast a big gaping hole in a battleship. <laughs> so... Myself and Ben, we have our two starter sets that, yep. we've, that we've got. Uh, ben is going to be playing the Prussian Empire Naval Battle Group, and I'm going to be playing the Covenant of Antarctica Naval Battle Group. Yeah. So, we've got them. We don't need those anymore. Let's Moving on. <laughs> what else are you going to need? You're going to need dice. Plenty and of dice. as I always recommend, you're going to need buckets of dice. So I've got my uber yellow dice of death here which um, I've primed up and I have charged them with my laser. So you oh, better wonderful. watch out. They are yeah. fully charged <laughs> in the book, in the box that I got, because not all the rules for the Covenant of Antarctica are in the main rule book, I got an extra little booklet with some additional kind yep. of rules and things. A bit more fluff and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, so. it's, it's got all the other bits and pieces in there that I need to play that army. Yeah. However, what we're going to be playing is very simple, so I don't even need that. Uh, templates. In any of the boxes that you buy, you'll find the templates. So I have the large turning template, which is for the kind of like the battleships. The big, huge capital ships, yeah. Something like that. Exactly. Uh, I have the medium turning template, 
which is for the cruisers and yep. things like that. So the second stage down, basically. A yeah. boat like that. Yeah. And I have the small turning template, which is used for your little frigates uh -huh. and things like that. The nippy uh, ones, basically. Then there's yeah. also a 45 degree turning template, which is used for tanks and things Latin like Judas, that. Basically, because here's the interesting thing about Dystopian Wars. And this is kind of what sets it apart from most other games for me in this yeah. genre. Dystopian Wars allows you to play land, air, and sea. Exactly. All, at the same all combined time. together. Yeah. So it's like all three theatres of war are basically covered in exactly. the one game. <laughs> so you can have things on land, firing massive kind of rockets and Tesla coils out to things that are on sea, things that are on sea battling with things that are in the air, and things in the air just blasting everything. Everything, yeah. yeah. You even get <laughs> walkers that can stride off into the sea and attack. Yeah. Uh, naval vessels and things like that. The one that uh, back people on have probably seen is the Metzger robot for the Prussians. Mm -hmm. uh, big, huge walking battle tank, basically. Walking the shallows, shooting everything. Crazy thing. So anyway, enough about all the different battles. Let's continue on. What else have you got in the box? The other thing that comes in the box are the little stat cards for yeah. each of the units. So. Let me take you through a stat card, okay? These are the kinds of the attributes that a model will have. Mm -hmm. Along the top of the stat card, you'll see DR, CR, MV, and HP. So DR is your damage rating. Yep. That's the, the number of hits your opponent will need to make on your battleship or your frigate before it receives one point of damage. Yep. yep. Next up, we have the CR, which is the critical rating. Uh -huh. Now, if your opponent can reach the critical rating, or more yep. in terms of hits, then what the, he'll get to roll on the critical table. Yep, which is pretty devastating. Which is pretty <laughs> devastating. You know, so a roll of a two on the critical table basically destroys the model. A roll of a uh, 12, the model will teleport into the ether, remove the model, it cannot return. <laughs> so the idea is that you're, you're piling your hits onto these, uh, these, these battleships and things you want to try and see if you can get a critical hit because you've got yeah. a chance of actually taking the yeah. model out. Yeah. Next up, you have MV, which is move. So that's just the distance that you can move. And let me give you a little indication of movement just to give you an idea of it. Um, movement is basically you measure if this particular item can move eight inches. It's a Plato class cruiser. So it could just move forward just the full eight inches like that. If, however, it needs to turn, you have to use the turning template, and each segment of the turning template is used a bit like this, and it's counted as an inch. So that's one, two, three inches, and then you can move the remaining five. The rest of your distance, yeah. It's after yeah. that, okay? So that gives you an indication of how you can uh, work your movement. Next up, we have HP, which is hull points. Yep. That's the number of points of damage your hull can take before it buckles. Sinks into the middle of the sea. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Underneath that, you then have some other attributes. You have AP, AA, CC, and RR. Yeah. So AP are attack points. Attack points, yeah. And that's basically the, the equivalent of the number of crew. It's a yeah. simulation of the number of crew yeah. you have on your boat. It's the amount of people on your board, your boat, that can fight in boarding actions and stuff like that, yeah. So it's used whenever you're doing the likes of boarding actions and things like that. But also what you can find is on the critical table that you can have suffer damage to your AP. Yes. So you get damage tokens on that, which reduces your effectiveness whenever you're doing things like boarding actions. You have less crew. The other thing is as you're taking damage to your hull, you can make less attacks as yes. well. So every one point of damage to your hull um, is one less point that you can use whenever you're doing your attacks, one less yeah. dice. Next, we have AA, which stands for ACAC. Basically, those guns in all the films. And that's all the fighter planes, yeah. <laughs> Badass guns that just yeah. fire nothing but flag and everything up into the, yeah. the air. You can take out uh, aircraft that are coming at you. Mm -hmm. You can take out uh, borders that are trying to fly over onto your ship and things like that. So it's amazing stuff. So, this, is yeah. the, this is one of the cool things about this, is whenever you actually have two ships, the boarding actions are actually quite interesting. Once you get within four inches mm -hmm. of, of a ship, your crew, you can choose an, a number of the crew members that actually strap on their rocket packs and, and propel over onto the other side, yeah. And yeah. go off onto the other ship before, you know, kicking ass. Kicking ass, yeah. yeah. Victorian style. <laughs> 
And then finally, we have, well, not finally, we have CC, which is? Concussion charges. Concussion charges. This is basically what you use to try and defend yourself against torpedoes and mines, mines and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So before you would uh, get hit by a torpedo or hit by a mine, you have the opportunity to basically roll a save. Yeah, try and take some of the damage out of the attacks and stuff like that. Keep your ship alive. And then finally, you have RR. Now, neither of the box sets we have has any value in RR yeah. because it's RAM rating. Mm -hmm. Ramrod. <laughs> so if you have a, a particular ship or vehicle that's geared up for ramming, it'll have a value in the RR. Yeah. Then you move over to the weapons on your stat card. Now, in your stat card, it'll list your weapons. And any weapons that are listed in white are the weapons that your vehicle comes with as standard. Yeah. If it's listed in a kind of like a purpley blue, that's an optional weapon that you'll have to either pay for or pay for and swap out exactly. one of your existing weapons yeah. to be able to get. Yeah. Now, Dystopian Wars works on range bands. Yeah. So whenever you're looking at the weapons, you'll see range one, two, three, and four. And these range bands are basically just multiples of eight inches. So range band one is eight inches, range band two is 16 inches, range band three is 24 inches, and range band four, 32. 32. <laughs> so you'll find that a lot of the weapons will actually just fire right up to the 32 inches. Yeah. But obviously the further away it is, the less dice you get to roll. And of course if a ship's damaged as well, it's gonna lose those dice. So you'll become less effective at range as things go on, so. So that in a nutshell is how the, the stats work, but yeah. How do you play a game? So, to start with, you'll need a play area. As you can see here, we have a C mat. I wonder how many of you can guess where that came from. <laughs> um, you and your opponent will put down your, your play area, which might be a combination of land and sea, which I highly recommend. And yes. as we get further yeah. and further into dystopian wars over the coming days and weeks, we're going to start looking more deeply at both land and sea battles taking place at the same time. Yeah. For the purpose of this, we're just going to concentrate on the sea. Basically, you divide it up into four quarters or four quadrants, yep. and you and your opponent can start Place putting down some terrain. Yep. So once you've placed your terrain, you then do a roll-off to see who deploys first. Yep. Now, before we do that, let's talk a little bit about the armies. Yes. Now, we're just using two very simple armies straight out of the box. We're not even using all the components that are in the box. No. So let me give you an indication of what my force is. It's the Covenant of Antarctica, and I have my main battleship, and that's considered one unit, I also, or one squadron, a squadron. squadron. So yeah, yeah. Next up, I have three cruisers, which are considered a squadron, and then I'm running two squadrons of frigates. Uh-huh. So that <clears throat> is my force for this demo game. Ben, what are you running? Uh, I'm playing as Prussian Empire, and I've got a battleship as well, which looks a lot more like the traditional one, I suppose mm -hmm. you'd think, from World War II. Uh, I, too, have three cruisers, which are in a squadron. And then I have, same as you again, four frigates together in two squadrons. There we go. Now we just felt that this was a nice, easy configuration to run with for your first game. Yeah. You get a yeah. you get a, a bunch of models, so exactly. it's not light on models. You're not playing with one ship each. Yeah. You get a bunch of models, but there's nothing too complex there in terms yeah. of how it's played. It's a nice starter way to play. Yeah. So to find out who deploys first, you simply roll two d six, and whoever gets the highest. Hey. Ooh, which is Ben in this instance. <laughs> So using all my sixes, this is... Uh... Where's my laser? I need to charge these dice. <laughs> so Ben gets to deploy first. So basically, Ben gets to choose a quarter, a table quarter, or in this instance, we're just going to play edge to edge because the yeah. beauty of this game is this game, as it currently stands, and as we're going to be talking about it this week, we're going to be talking about it from a very narrative game point of view. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back and look at it from a tour tournament play type thing at another time. But it's from a narrative point of view, you can just set the table up whatever way you want, choose whatever deployment yeah. zones you want. It's all about just, the story, basically. Just, yeah. just yeah. go mad, have fun. <laughs> so we're basically just going to choose table edges, and Ben, you're going to choose that edge. I am, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a surprise. What a surprise. <laughs> so Ben, go ahead and just deploy your, your first 
Your right. first item. Uh, well, and I will I'm going to go out of the way. with a, uh, a squadron of my frigates first, I think, since it'll be interesting to see what you deploy next and see if I can gauge af- off what you do, what I'll deploy after that. So let's go for a squadron of the frigates over here. There we go. Okay, so it's my turn. Now, I'm still quite new to the game, but there's there's certain things that I do understand, and one is that some units move faster than other units. So I don't want to put my slow units in front of my fast units, because my fast units, if the process of overtaking them, are likely to crash into them, <laughs> exactly. which is not good. You don't want your own fleets crashing into no, each other. No. So I'm going to... Uh, Keep my frigates to the fore because I like the idea of using my frigates as a means of getting in there, softening up the enemy. And because they're faster than everything else, I'm going to keep them to the front. Yeah. So I'm going to deploy my frigates well forward in this instance. So there you go, Ben. And it's back to you. Right. I think I will match your frigates with another squadron of frigates. I will put mine down as well. Frigate. Yeah. Screening the battlefield, so. And we'll have them right there. It's also important when you're setting up to look at the weapons that your ships have uh, and to sort of manoeuvre them and put them in a good deployment so their weapons are bought to the, you know, the maximum efficiency mm-hmm. when you put them in, so. Well, at this point, I'm going to try and see if I can catch Ben out. Ah. Because instead of deploying another row of frigates, because I see that Ben has basically created an entire front line of frigates, I'm starting to, th- to think perhaps I can put in something at the front that could potentially do some damage. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to bring my cruisers up in this one. I'm going Good to idea. deploy my three cruisers uh, to try and get them positioned to move uh, to get within range. Because the cruisers, uh, whenever they shoot, they have a number of options. They can shoot fore and aft where they have turrets yep. which gives them a nice wide range and the turrets are nasty on these things but they also have broadsides that can be fired from the from side the sides, yeah. the beauty of getting this side on is I have the ability to fire my broadsides but also my turrets as exactly. well so I get a lot of firepower there so I'm going to deploy that there and see if I can force some damage on you hmm. right well I'm going to bring out the big guns now and I'll deploy back my uh, battleship. I'll put him behind those frigates. Now you see, this is great because battleships can see over the smaller frigates. So I've got a screen against your cruisers, but I can fire back at you. So, uh-huh. see if you can match that. <laughs> well, in this instance, I have more frigates. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna line them up behind these other frigates because uh, they're of a similar speed. I'm hoping I should be able to separate them out a little yeah. bit to try and get some space to fire among them. Yeah. So that's that turn done. All right. Well, the final ones are the cruisers. And we'll put these guys over here, perhaps. And we'll see if we can get a little bit of a flanking action going on with those now, guys. Now, that is sneaky. <laughs> he has just deployed them just off camera, which is, or just on camera, which yeah. is very sneaky, Ben. I wasn't expecting <laughs> that. But anyway, I'm going to take my, my main battleship. I'm going to hold it back here. Right. So once deployment's over, the next thing you need to do is allocate which ship your Commodore is in. So um, what we've been playing over this last day or two is basically the kind of scenario is if you can kill the Commodore, the game's over, rather than slogging out to the very last ship. Exactly. We've been playing a a bit more of a tactical game of kill the Commodore. (laughs) Now, the Commodore has to be in a capital-class ship. Does that mean that he has to be in either a cruiser or a battleship, or just a battleship? Uh, Battleship's usually the best one to go for. Most armor, most guns, probably keep your fleet Commodore alive. Uh, Yeah. Especially if, I mean, if the fleet Commodore goes down, a lot of your bravery checks are going to go badly and stuff like that. So it's good to put him in the big heavy one. So, so in this instance, and it's an absolute no-brainer, because the, the, the capital battleship class ships are the most resilient, yeah. we're going to just declare exactly them in the battleships. There you go. So that's that. Um, the next thing we do is then roll for initiative. And yeah. that'll be us starting the first turn. So join us in just one second where we'll go through turn one.
So guys, we're about to embark on turn one. Yep. But now's as good a time as any to mention what's called the Fog of War cards. Yeah. Now these are these are kind of an optional kind of meta game or an optional mini game yeah. that you can play they with it. Do you they want don't to come in the it? actual boxes themselves, mm -hmm. but you can buy it as a uh, separate pack from mm -hmm. Spartan. And it basically adds like another dimension to the game. It uh, can think, do things like affect your initiative, stuff like that, make guns better, uh, defend against oncoming torpedoes and stuff like that. It's just a little bit of an additional spin to the game. So, so it adds a wee bit more randomness to the game, which yeah. basically simulates yeah. the Fog of War. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in a nutshell, it's basically you draw one Fog of War card per, per squadron. Four, per squadron, yep. Uh, so as time goes on, you'll lose the cards and stuff like that. So you have to really see about what the best time is to play a card. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to look at your cards you've got, see how the battlefield, battlefield's going, uh, judge the flow of everything, really. So The other little thing it adds to the game is it makes you much more careful with your squadrons. Yes. So you may find a squadron which is down to one unit, which when you're not using Fog of War, you'll say, ah, go on, throw it in there and <laughs> see what it can kill. But when you're relying on that to be able to draw your Fog of War card, exactly. you might just say, yeah. well, do you know what, I'm going to keep that. I'm going to go and hide behind that. Yeah, I'm going to hide and see how it goes. So to start the game, we've done the deployment. Yep. Um, we've declared which ships have our Commodore in them. Exactly. It's now down to the turns. Uh, now, turns always start with a roll for activation to uh -huh. see who gets to go first. And I love this. Uh, I've loved this awesome. mechanic in <clears throat> many games, and it's it's again, it's a perfect one in this game because yeah. you could find at the end of the turn, you're just wishing that you get to go <laughs> it first. It makes some next really turn. tense moments. Yeah. <laughs> so it's simply a matter of rolling two d six. Looks like the look of the gods is with me again. Look, Ten. Unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Where's my laser? <laughs> So, right. Ben gets to basically move, he gets to activate a unit or a squadron, yep. and then you basically, you move it, and then you can shoot with it. Yep, you resolve all the actions for that squadron, and then it moves on to something Does else. it matter what order you resolve them in? Um, you usually want to try and get it so you do it in the most beneficial order to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to get the things that are probably not going to get as much firepower in first, just to weaken things up, yeah. and then take things out with a bigger blast. And whenever so, I activate a unit, can I shoot with it first, or do I have to move with it You first? have to move first. Yep. Uh, there are some, maybe in the Fog of War cards, that will allow you to uh, shoot before you move. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, more often than not, it's always move before you shoot. The so. other thing you have to remember, guys, is this is at sea. So naval units must move a minimum of two inches. Yeah. And that kind of simulates the fact that you know, the drifting it's, it's all like water that. and it drifts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. so tape measure. And Here we go. You can activate your first squadron. Right, well I think I'm going to go with one of my squadrons of frigates. Mm -hmm. Get them moved up, see if they can do a little bit of damage. So, uh, I think I'll activate this one here. Uh, and I think it sounds about right to just go straight forward. Yes, sounds good to me. I think we need to power forward and get my front guns... Uh, Trained on those frigates of yours, I think. Mm -hmm. So we'll go for that. Uh, so my movement is 13 inches. So, oh, and it's an important thing as well. You can measure at any time in this game. Yep. Which is always important because it means you can check your range bands and stuff. Yeah, like there's that. no there's no yeah. guessing ranges or things yeah. like that yeah. in this. So. Right, so I set to 13 inches. Measure, and let's move those ships forward. There we go. Now we have a little convention, kind of like what we do in 40k, that you move the first one and you know the others are basically yeah, the same. Yeah, a little bit of leeway. It good, speeds so. things up, yeah. uh, right. no end. Now, are you in range to shoot at that? Right, well I'm probably not going to be in range band 1, which is 8 inches as we mm -hmm. mentioned before. So, but we'll check anyway and see who we are. No. So, I'm going to be in range band 2, which is 16 inches. And everything is in. That's good. Right, now, with shooting, we can either have every one of them individually, Mm -hmm. Or we can do what's called linked fire. Yeah. Right, and this will enable ships to try and put more dice into a pool to try and break that damage rating mm -hmm. and break that critical rating. Uh, in this case, we're against frigates, so I probably don't need to crack the shell too much. Yeah. So I'm probably going to do some one-on-ones, see mm -hmm. if we can take more, multiple of them out. So in a Fog of War game, that would be great because you try and take out every single one of the frigates, yeah. which would mean they'd lose a card. Mm -hmm. So let's have a go with that. Now we'll fire this one, uh, that one. Uh, now, in range band 2, with my 4 turrets, I get 3 dice. Mm -hmm. So, pick 3 dice up. Look at the gods will be with me. 
Not today. Not really. <laughs> now, in order to score a hit, you need uh, you need basically a five or a six or four, five, oh, four, or, five or six. Or six. Yeah. So four plus will, would actually be a hit. Yeah. Now the other thing is, if he had rolled a six, a six counts as two. Yes. But not only does it count as two, you can re-roll it. Yeah. So if he had rolled a four, a one, a four, and a six, he would have had one, two, three. He gets to re-roll that, which would have been four. Yep. So that's how you can find that even small frigates, if they run a, roll a lucky roll, a single frigate could effectively yeah. put a battleship onto uh, the critical, the critical exactly. hit table. Yeah. So there, there is the whole element of things, small things, just it's the getting a lucky element. shot. Yeah, Heroics getting that stuff, lucky yeah. shot. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about the linked fire, I am keen to see this linked yeah, fire. Yeah, we'll show that now. So linked fire basically allows you to roll more dice, right? Yeah. Because if you have to get, for example, on my frigates, I have a damage rating of three and a critical rating of five. That means m the minimum you need to get to be able to even do one point of damage on my frigates is three hits, yeah. okay? Now, obviously, you're going to get your more chances of getting more hits the more dice you roll. Exactly. So the whole linked fire thing is a really good way of doing that. Yeah. So if you did linked fire of those three figures, right. how would that work then? So you choose the primary one. <coughs> so we'll say that one there. And it gets all of its dice. Yep. So in this case, range band two, three dice. Mm -hmm. Then the other two ships get half their dice rounded down. Mm -hmm. So in this case, a three, two, but we'll say one. So yep. that's an extra two dice in. Now, as before, I was rolling three dice against your three hole. Mm -hmm. It wasn't getting three, but now I've got five dice. Hopefully that should bring one down. So we'll fire at this one here, shall we? Roll the dice as normal. That's a bit better. One, two, three, four, five, five. Now, that breaks through your damage rating, I think? Yep, on yeah. uh, a frigate, it actually, five lands onto my critical rating. Right, well, a critical hit on a frigate destroys it outright. So, Bang. that is one frigate down. <laughs> but, that is all my squadron <coughs> done. And now it moves on to you. And now it's my turn. Yeah. Now I want to put the pain <laughs> onto him. So what I'm going to do is, I'm actually going to move my cruisers forward. Sounds good. And bring my big gun, guns right onto this yep. unit. So, my cruisers are Plato-class cruisers and they have a movement eight inches. Yeah. Bearing in mind, I have to move two inches minimum. Um, I'm just going to move the full eight inches and hope that I can actually cut my way through this squadron of, uh, yeah. um, because if I can't, I'm taking a risk here because I may end up crashing into him <laughs> in the next turn, which again, could, could be painful for me possibly really as well. <laughs> So my hope is that I can do uh, I can do a lot of damage here. Yeah. So I have a lot of weaponry. Um, the only thing that I didn't do, which maybe I should have done, and I will demonstrate that now, is during the movement of this particular one, if I had picked out my middle-sized medium turning template, I may have had the chance of working out one, two, three, four inches to turn it sideways. Mm -hmm. So if I had have moved it just four inches forward and then moved it four inches, one, two, three, four, well, three would have done. Yeah. Okay. That gets me side on. It does. Which gets me even more shots. <laughs> um, however, it does cause a, a slight positioning issue for me in that this is now facing the other way. So there is a chance... It means I'm going to have to spend more movement now to try and bring it back yeah. in line. Yeah. Because you have to maintain a squadron coherency. Yeah. Um, so any ships inside a squadron or any vehicles inside a squadron need to remain within six inches of six each other. Six inches of each other, yeah. If, for example, this one fell outside of the six inches, whenever I come to activate this squadron, I'd have to choose whether exactly. to move these yeah. two or this one. Yeah. So you can find yourself very quickly having a ship that just lies there idling because it's not getting yeah. orders and, yeah. and whatnot. So I've been rather sneaky. I'm ah. hoping that I can put the pain <laughs> on you here, Ben. So I'm gonna I'm gonna now move into my shooting phase. 
So, my cruisers have a couple of weapons that I can use. They have the main turrets and they have the port and starboard broadsides. Yep. So I'm going to start with this one here. And I'm going to fire its main turrets, which gives Sounds me good. seven dice because I am definitely within in range band one. Within range band one. Yep. So I get my seven dice, three, six, seven. And again, I'm looking for fours, fives, and sixes. And sixes yeah. So one, two, three, which I don't think is going to be enough to get through. That's not a critical, but that is a damage rating. It is so a that's damage rating. Point rate. of damage on one of my ships. So, so. we pick up a, a single damage token and we put it next to that guy. There we go. Now, um, next up, I'm going to fire my broadside, which is yep. six dice. At the same one again? Same one again. Try and take him out. That's a lot now, better. Now, this is much better. So, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I get to re-roll my sixes. Eight. Now, that's definitely a critical hit. So, that is one ship gone. That just blows <laughs> them out of the water. Next up, um, I have these two. Now, I need to be careful here in that making sure that I remove the ones that are closest to me and that might sail in my direction yeah so i'm going to fire i can't fire my broadsides because they're not facing they're not in the arc so all i can do is fire the turrets so the turrets again give me seven dice yeah so this guy's turret on this ship here sounds good another good roll <laughs> yeah so one <laughs> two three four, four five six well that's beating the critical rating again another dead frigate Boom! <laughs> and um, you removed the wrong one. Did I? Yes. All oh, right. See, watch your opponents in this game. They cheat. Uh, that's it. That's it. That's more like it. That's what I am. Next, <laughs> this one here on this guy right. here. So my seven dice again. Another good one. Another excellent roll. You see that lasers make all the difference, guys. Especially in this whole steampunk era. They loved lasers. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. Roll my dice again, seven. and I get seven, and I know seven's going to blow them out of the water. Yeah. Taking this one, yet? Yeah. Yep. Cool. All right. So, I believe at this stage, can you do a boarding action? You can do a boarding action, yes. Okay, well, do you want to talk us through how a boarding uh, action takes right. place? Uh, well, as long as you're within four inches of another ship, you can do a boarding action, and this uses your attack power, mm -hmm. right? Uh, now, you don't have to use all of your attack power to board another ship because you want to keep some of your crew on board in case something else goes wrong or somebody else boards you. Yeah. So you look at your stat card and mm -hmm. you go, how much attack power have I got? Well, the Plato class cruisers have attack power of four. Right. So you might think, well, this is just a frigate, not a lot of other ships nearby. I might as well send all four over. Mm -hmm. But they do risk dying as well. So you've got to sort of weigh up that uh, risk and that risk yeah. factor basically. So you choose your AP, how many you want to send over, four inches away. Rock it over and attack the frigate. Now is a good time to ask your opponent, what is the attack power of that? Right. The attack power of my frigate is three. It's three. Yeah. And can more than one ship do a boarding action? You can link the two, yes. So you could have both you could have everybody going over at once, yeah. So it has to be within four inches to has be able to, be within to do four that. Inches, yeah. So just checking, I have one two ships within four inches, and unfortunately yeah. the third one isn't. So Let's run through a single ship. So if it was a single ship doing a boarding action, yep. and I sent three of my four yep. so you'll draw crew three, over. You'd roll three dice, mm -hmm. and I'd have three dice. But importantly, I do get my ACAC against you. Mm -hmm. So you sent three guys over, but I have two ACAC guns that I can try and use to take out your, before, your boarders before they get to my ship. Because remember, these border guys are coming over with their rocket jet packs, packs on. Yeah. <laughs> Steve so jet I would pack. roll my three, or do you roll your ACAC I roll ACAC my first. two first, okay. see if I can get some hits. Whoa. One, two, three, four, five. I've killed all of your boarders before they even got to me. That's well, it's just as well, that's not what I was going to do. <laughs> so in this instance, now we're going to demonstrate how we do a linked boarding action. Yeah. Okay. And this time, Ben, I'm going to send everybody over. Right. I'm going to send all eight. <sighs> well, I better get my ACAT ready then. <laughs> Here we go. Ah, only one this time. 
So that's one okay. less dice for you. So I only get to board with seven. So one yeah. of my crew members, er, one of my crew members is dead. Yeah. In which case you take the green token. There we go. And I will set it beside this one to go. symbol that it is now one kind of crew number now. Basically, yeah. So I go ahead and roll my seven dice. Yep. And then I roll my attack power back. And I get one, two, three, four. Ooh, just four. Four. Right. It's the last ditch attempt with my guys then. Oh, I only need two. So you lost two more crew. But importantly, you've wiped out all of my crew. Mm -hmm. Now, this ship, once you've killed all the crew, becomes a prize, right? Yep. And you'll take a little prize token, which you can find over there, mm -hmm. and it'll go next to the ship, and you will get double victory points for that ship now. Okay. Yeah. So tokens, um, you, you can find <laughs> it in the rule book. I think it's like page 24 or something like so, that, yeah. where you'll find all whole the, sheet of it, the whole sheet of all the different yeah. tokens. So there's a prize token in among here. Yeah. Um, what does it look like? It's there we go. Bright green, bright green, I think so. There's the prize token. Yeah. So that ship is now considered a prize. Yeah. Can it be retaken or recaptured? Or I can get people over there to try and retake it because importantly, you've got whatever's left of your crew on that ship. And so I can't move them back onto my ships until, until the next activation. The next activation. Yeah. So at the moment, they're like they're sorting through the thing, getting all the loot, basically. Mm -hmm. It also means that these ships are now vulnerable to boarding actions. Yes, because um, they've got less crew on because them. Because yeah. they actually have no crew on them. Yeah. Because I sent everybody <laughs> over. However, because he's a reasonable distance away... You should be safe. I think I'll be okay. Yeah. I hope I'll be okay. <laughs> so there's, um, there's kind of the first turn. Yeah. What we're going to do now is uh, set up a few little scenarios to show you some of the other kinds of things that can happen in terms of shooting and, and combat. Yeah.